So, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second talk of the spring session. So again, in case there are some you know, new audience here, so these talk series are given by the awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship, uh, which was founded by the National Central University and uh, the Delta Electronics Foundation to recognize young scholars uh, who have made outstanding contributions in this field. So each year, the new awardee will be invited to Taiwan to give talks and interact with us. So the original plan was to invite all the previous awardees to come back to Taiwan. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we have to make this event fully online due to the pandemic. So uh, our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Matthew Holman from CFA. So I think Matt received this award in uh, 2012. And I just confirmed that he is the very first awardee you know, of this lectureship. And yeah, so that's amazing. So he's the world, world expert in studying the dynamics of our solar system and the extrasolar planetary systems. And I think he has discovered many moons, you know, especially those gas planets in our solar system. And it's our great pleasure to have him here. The title of his talk today is um, The Continuum Search for the Planet Nine. So just a few announcements here. Uh, please mute yourself during the talk. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat box. We will come back to those questions in, uh, in the middle of the talk or do, during the Q&A session after the talk. All right, Matt, so please take it away. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. And, and thank you all for, uh, for attending the talk. It's, it's a great honor to have this opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, yeah, my, my training, as was said, is in solar system dynamics. But my research these days is Really, I work in exoplanets, wide field uh, surveys of the solar system and data science, but I, I really particularly like to work with data sets that are at the intersections of these fields. Uh, in particular, I've spent a lot of time working with PanSTARS data, uh, with TESS. I'm now working a lot with Gaia and looking forward to uh, Ruben LSST. Um, excuse me. So today we're, I'm going to be talking about this, this question, uh, why do we think there are undiscovered planets in our solar system? Um, we're gonna, I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time with a, an historical overview, but I'm going to keep coming back to this, and I'll hope that I can, I'll, I'll show you some fair, uh, a number of lines of current evidence um, that make us think that there, there could very well be undiscovered planets in our solar system. But as many of your astronomers, um, you know we're living in a, in a golden era of continued exploration of our solar system. There's really been one remarkable discovery after another going on really for decades, if not hundreds of years. Uh, but I like to make the point that these discoveries are driven by the technologies of their time. And that's true even today, any advance in technology has resulted in some, some, some new discovery. But in addition to technology, it always comes down to um, basic human curiosity. Somebody asking you know, a big question, you know, what's out there? Is there anything else? Is there something left to be discovered? So for many of you, this is, this is uh, not anything new, but this is a, a an image showing the position of Mars over the course of a year. Um, and as was known really to the ancients, the, the planets make these looping trajectories on the sky. And that's a combination of both the planet's motion, but actually more it's the Earth's motion or the changing perspective as the Earth moves around the sun, uh, which is, you know, we see the parallax um, is really what largely results in these, these parallactic loops. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, even this is the, um, the way moving objects really are found is to, to see them moving against the background of more distant, uh, seemingly stationary stars uh, as the earth makes its way around the sun. And in terms of technology, you know, for the ancients, it was really the human eye, um, human memory, very simple measurements and, and simple records. Uh, but that technology, you know, the very, very basics 
uh, coupled with human curiosity and imagination, you know, led Copernicus to the understanding that it's really a better model uh, to think of the planets, including the Earth, as orbiting the sun uh, rather than all, everything orbiting the Earth. Um, so this, this, this I like that Herschel uh, in, 19, in 1781 discovers Uranus while observing with this, his new his telescope here, new technology from his garden in England. Right, so there's several things that really can't happen anymore. I mean, I mean it's remarkable actually, but this was advanced technology at the time, and he was making. I don't know if his observations were all that systematic, but he was, you know, looking, um, you know, searching for things and and mostly, you know, keeping some records. Uh, but he did spot Uranus. He was not the first to do that. It had been seen before, but recorded as a star. Herschel was the one who recognized that it was moving, but he also knew that the object he was looking at, he could, he could see its diameter. He could see that it was resolved. And he was smart enough to realize that that meant that the object had to be fairly close, much closer than the stars, and that it was likely a member of, of the solar system. Decades later, after Uranus had made almost a full orbit around the sun, its trajectory starts, started showing anomalies, deviations from the expected path on the sky. Um, and those deviations could not be explained by the gravitational effects of the sun and the other planets that were known at the time. Well, the Verrier, Adams and others suggested that there was an additional planet and they predicted its location based on the, the mathematical analytical work that they had done. And they, uh, they, they, you know, so they made this prediction and in 1846, Gall and, and others discovered Neptune. It's, it's within a degree of arc of the predicted location. And within 17 days, Triton, the largest moon of Neptune was, was identified um, by Lassell. And these discoveries, this sort of idea that there's this moving front of discovery in the outer solar system from Uranus to Neptune, and as we know, well beyond, they at the time uh, inspired many people and spurred astronomical research. One of those people, Percival Lowell, was uh, inspired, was a young man from a prominent Massachusetts family. Um, he uh, he decided to, to study astronomy and, and, and commit some of his fortune to astronomy. He, he founded Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894. As some of you may know, he, he was motivated by canals on Mars. Right? He really thought that what they were seeing, some of the, some of the features on Mars were made, they were made by civilizations. And obviously that's not true, but it was, part of his most motivation. And so it's kind of a sense of like nothing, there's nothing new under the sun that you know, people are still, even back then were motivated by um, extraterrestrial life forms and, and what that might mean for us. But he was also motivated by the prospect of a planet, what he called planet X, uh, that there would be an unseen planet tugging on Neptune because like Uranus, Neptune seemed to show deviations in its motion and deviations that were, they thought caused by uh, uh, another massive planet and Lowell wanted to go find that planet. So, one, so a number of things distinguished Lowell. Um, he insisted that capable qualified people be hired to carry out his vision at his observatory. And one of those people is, is pictured here is Clyde Tombaugh. Um, if, you, if you want somebody who can work long hours who um, can follow a routine, a schedule, and who's essentially immune to monotony, you wanna hire a farm kid. Uh, and Tombaugh had been a farm kid. He grew up in Kansas, went to the University of Kansas and studied astronomy before he was hired to do this job. Lowell also insisted on using the best technology. You know, again, that's, that's one of the themes is using uh, technology leads to advances. Um, and so he, he insisted on using 
at the time, modern telescopes, photographic plates. So that's a big, a big difference is that, you know, you go from making a record with a human eye to making a record with a photographic plate. And, you know, photographic plates have, have long been superseded by more sensitive technology, but that was really leading technology at the time. And you could see there was another, another piece of technology, something called the blink comparator. So in this diagram, uh, you'll, you see this, you know, this is an enormous photographic plate, uh, physically large, but what, and there's, a, there's another one near it. And what Tombaugh is doing here is switching from one image to the other so that he can look, he can compare those images and look for motion from one to the next. Um, in 1930, a little more than a year after he started, Tombaugh found this. This is, these are the, the discovery images of Pluto. And, and normally they don't, you know, they don't come with an arrow that shows you where the object is. Uh, so he had, he was, you know, you sort of look and imagine without those arrows having to go back and forth. Um, and you can see, you know, here are the stars lined up. You know, it's this little dot of light that's actually by modern standards quite bright. But, you know, so at the time there was, his technology was the, you know, photographic plates, the blink comparator and a lot of hard visual inspection. But it paid off, and you know this is Pluto, and and it's the first two letters in the name honor Percival Lowell and his support for astronomy. There are a lot of other surprises that we we know from the New Horizons mission. But um, at the time, you know Pluto had a very weird has a weird orbit. You know, not like any other of the planets that were known at the time. It's inclined by more than you know nearly twenty degrees to the plane of the solar system. Uh, it has a very elliptical orbit that brings it closer than Neptune at its uh, pericenter and, and much farther at its apocenter. Um, uh, but so that it took actually a number of years of careful observation to determine Pluto's orbit and to show that for every, twi every two times that Pluto goes around, Neptune goes around three times. Um, so early on, there was a lot of work uh, that went into determining Pluto's orbit. Uh, Pluto's, at the time, Pluto's mass was unknown and they were still hoping that Pluto was massive enough or would be mass enough, massive enough to explain what they thought were anomalies in the trajectory of Neptune. So maybe somebody can ask me a question about that. How did that get resolved? Uh, the, the, you know, the, the apparent anomalies in Neptune's orbit. But, there was another surprise that helps answer the question of what is Pluto's mass? And this is a picture of Jim Christie at the US Naval Observatory. He had been part of a program where they were taking repeated you know, regular photographic plates of Pluto in order to determine, you know, to better refine Pluto's orbit. This had been going on for decades and it's a really kind of a fabulous data set. We'll come back to that. Uh, but what he noticed is there's two images um, that every so often he would see what looked like a weirdly out of focus picture of Pluto. And then he figured out it wasn't just every so often, it was every 6.4 days. And so what he was seeing is Sharon, so uh, it was named actually after his wife, Charlene. This is, this is at, you know, what they're maximum extent, you could barely resolve the images of Pluto and Sharon. Now that we've got these you know, new horizons, you know, fabulous close-up pictures of Pluto Sharon and, and the whole in, in, incredibly rich uh, Pluto Sharon system, it's kind of hard to believe that this, this is really cutting edge at the time. And it's not all that many decades before. But you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that given that they could measure the angular and and physical separation of uh, Pluto and its main moon and the orbital period, they could get the mass of the Pluto-Charon system. And they found out that the system is less massive than our own moon and is nowhere close enough to be, you know, nowhere massive enough to potentially explain what they thought were anomalies in, in Neptune's trajectory. In the 30s, up through the 50s, people like uh, Kenneth Edgeworth, Gerard Kuiper, Fred Whipple asked why the solar system should abruptly stop 
why should there be uh, an edge? You know, beyond Neptune, there's nothing else. Um, why shouldn't there be more to the solar system? That, there's that same question of this sort of moving front of discovery in our, our, our solar system. And in the late 80s, computers and algorithms were getting faster and much better. Simulations showed that short period comets uh, probably originated from a flattened disk just beyond Neptune, rather than and that some of them were coming from a spherical cloud, but a lot of them were coming from a flattened disk. And um, at the, around that time, you know, so this combination of there was a you know, new theory driven or you know, enabled by better computers, uh, better uh, algorithms, allow people to you know make really a theoretical prediction in some sense that the the short period comets are probably coming from this disk uh, there needed to be a reservoir because short period comets are are dynamically short-lived so they have to be coming from someplace dave jewett and jane Liu, pictured here uh set out set to the task of finding this this kuiper belt which is what they began to call it really in, in this sort of theoretical work people like uh, scott tremaine uh, dubbed it the Kuiper Belt, although it could have many different names. So Dave, Dave Jewett and Jane Liu, they um, carefully decided that they would search a certain amount of sky and then stop if they didn't find anything. And they picked a square degree of sky. They were, they had a powerful new tool, which was the CCD camera, this charge coupled device. What uh, distinguishes the char charge coupled device is it's digital and it records nearly every photon that hits it, where a photographic plate might record just a few percent of the photons that hit. So suddenly, even with a modest telescope, you've got a much more sensitive uh, instrument and coupled with desktop computers that were relatively new at the time, it was possible to reduce the data. And so th these are the, the baby pictures of 1992 QB1, the first Kuiper belt object after Pluto to be discovered. Uh, so this was the, and there, so uh, there, there are four images here separated by you know, a span of hours. And you see, again, they don't come with the arrow. They uh, actually physically blinked these images um, looking for the things that were moving. And you see an asteroid that's trailed is marked there. It's closer, moving faster. So these are probably eight, 10 minute exposures to the asteroids trail. But 1992 QB1 is, is unresolved and untrailed in those images. And you can see it moving al along. And there's a, a few notable things. One is that the object moves at a rate. So this is parallax. So the, the rate uh, is gonna go as one over the distance. Uh, from the observer. So it moves at a rate that puts it out beyond Neptune. Um, it's also faint. It's probably 23rd, 24th magnitude. So it, even, you know, uh, it, even if, if it, in the darkest, you know, assuming a very small albedo, uh, it must be significantly smaller than Pluto. And that they did this survey for one square degree and found one object, unless they're incredibly, we're incredibly lucky, that has to imply that there are thousands and thousands, maybe you know, tens of thousands of these objects in the solar system, depending upon how they're distributed. So this really amazing thing launched a new era. And again, I emphasize that it's you know, driven by technology, but also driven by individual human curiosity. You know, Dave Jewett, Jane Liu, and the, all the theorists making this prediction really like trying to answer this question. Is there anything out, else out there beyond Neptune? And sure enough, so this launched a new era that continues to this day and that there are now thousands of what are more typically called trans-Neptunian objects. Um, and there again, the technology just changed. There are better, te better telescopes, larger digital cameras, uh, massive computer systems being applied to this problem. And, and there are usually much larger teams of people. That's the uh, thing that has changed. That, that even though there's still individual human curiosity trying to answer, you know, answer questions that, that drive us, uh, but it, it you know requires you know teams and teams of people. So in the roughly 
30 years that have elapsed since the discovery of, of 1992 QB1, um, there's, you know, the suggestion is there's much, much more to be found. 